Okay. Okay, so a very warm welcome to everyone joining us today um, for Queer Feminist Challenges for State and Law webinar. Great to see so many people from LSBU and outside university coming to this talk. Uh, my name is Clara Erukmanov. I am one of the co-leads of the Race, Gender and Sexualities Research Group and your host for this afternoon. So before we start, um, I have some virtual uh, housekeeping to go through, so please bear with me. Everyone attending or speaking at an LSB event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. LSB operates on an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We value contributions, feedback, comments, and uh, wish to create a space for sharing, learning, celebrating, and bringing communities together. LSB does not tolerate any form of bullying, uh, of abuse, harassment, or discrimination. Inappropriate behavior will be treated and acted upon and removed uh, from the webinar. Um, so we want our events to be an enjoyable, safe, and warm experience for all. Uh, so thank you for adhering to these guidelines. So a couple of things uh, with uh, recording. As I mentioned, we are recording this event, um, but if you do not wish to feature, please do keep your camera off um, throughout the webinar. Uh, and if you're uncomfortable with this, um, but if you are uncomfortable with this, uh, we'd love to see you uh, during the Q&A. Um, please use the chat box throughout the event to share your thoughts, questions, and comments. Let us know who you are, what you do, and where uh, you're joining us from. It's, lo it's also uh, lovely to know where our audience members uh, are coming from. There will be an opportunity for a Q&A at the end uh, of the webinar, during which we invite you to turn your cameras on, unmute your mics, and engage with our speakers and with each other. Um, this part will not be recorded. We, uh, I think, uh, we have enabled closed captioning. Um, Elian, if you could uh, enable the closed captioning, that would be great um, for those who require it. Uh, if you don't wish to see the subtitles, uh, you can hide these by clicking on the up arrow next to the CC Live uh, transcript at the bottom of the screen and selecting uh, hide subtitles, but we do not enable them, uh, but we do enable them in the interest of accessibility and inclusivity. Um, and please take conference break as and when you need. So a warm uh, welcome to this webinar hosted by the research group uh, Race, Gender and Sexualities, which is part of the wider Social Justice uh, and Global Responsibility Research Center at LSBU. So before I introduce our stellar panel of speakers today, first a few words about um, the aims of this uh, conversation. So I, th I believe the webinar uh, will uh, first aim to foreground queer and feminist critiques of the state by raising questions about the relationship between the state, uh, gender and feminism, asking whether the state can be used strategically, made an ally to feminist, trans and queer struggles by institutionalizing feminist values, or whether the state should be left out, uh, excluded or subverted by feminists uh, as attempts by the state to include gender has led uh, or can often lead to depolitization. Uh, it also can lead to co-opting the co-opting of feminism. This webinar will also intervene in identitarian discourses, redressing perhaps traditional understandings of gender and Black trans feminism, which will uh, lead us to questions about gender's uh, destruction or gender's abolition. Uh, and in that respect, we will examine uh, the reforming of the gender legal status and more particularly the recent calls for the state to decertify gender, as well as the implications of such imaginary law for addressing questions of social justice uh, and equality. And so I have with me uh, and the honor to be joined today by uh, four incredible speakers whose recent projects uh, and work addresses these timely issues and who I think it is fair to say uh, hold and theorize very rich, plural uh, and perhaps opaque uh, if I use um, some of Marcus' formulation conceptions uh, of gendered identities. So first we have uh, Dr. Marion Tillou uh, from uh, Université Paris 8 and the Gender and Sexualities Research uh, Laboratoire and Dr. Cornelia Molzer from the uh, Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique who will be talking about their research, uh, recently published book uh, collection uh, entitled, and this is a translation for me, so please forgive me if this is not the right one, um, with, without or against queers, feminist critiques uh, of the state. 
This will be followed by uh, Professor Davina Cooper from Dixon Foon School of Law, who is the author of numer numerous books on the state, on utopias, the diversity and the politics of belonging, and who will today be speaking about the current uh, ESRC funded project called The Future of the Legal Gender, which explores the, the ramifications of the state abolition, uh, legal sex and gender status. Um, I think I will also add the uh, website and URL of the project in the chat box uh, shortly so you can have a look at the special issue that has been published recently, as well as the uh, interesting podcast series. Um, and then, uh, 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 last but not least, um, we have uh, Dr. Marcus Bay from Northwestern University. Um, and Marcus's work uh, explores blackness and fugitivity, transness, uh, and black feminist theory. And today, Marcus will be talking about their upcoming book called Black Trans Feminism, which is coming out, uh, I think uh, you said, uh, in sometime in February. So an opportunity to celebrate uh, here. And finally, we're also joined by Dr. Penelope uh, Mendonca, a graphic facilitator and values-based cartoonist. Uh, Ben's Penn's practice includes 25 years of work on social justice and human rights. And she will today create a graphic visualization of this uh, webinar and of this conversation, which uh, I will circulate uh, to speakers and to the audience um, uh, by email and on social media. So without further ado, I'm sorry to have taken up uh, so much time already, but I will let our first speakers, uh, Mario and Cornelia, to take the floor to talk about their book. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Clara, for organizing this session and inviting us and to give us uh, the opportunity to the first time uh, to present our book in an English speaking context. So, so thank you so much. So we will begin with uh, the history and motivation of the book project. So maybe if you want to just have a quick look at the book. That's it. Uh, <laughs> we're very proud. <laughs> so this idea of um, uh, the idea of this book was born about five years ago uh, from the shared uh, astonishment that the state is not or had hardly discussed as such in feminist and queer cycles in France, except for the question of uh, institutionalization um, and the question of uh, shall we, shall we not integrate our feminist action into the field of the state. So obviously, as our work uh, progressed, we came across various texts on the subject. Um, of um, feminist texts on the, the subject of the state, but uh, the impression remained that these discussions were not central, that they were much less central than elsewhere, uh, for example, in Brazil or in South America to begin with. So the text uh, at the beginning of uh, our book uh, is uh, an, an extract of the, the one chanted by the Chilean, Chilean feminist group, uh, Las Tesis, and taken up by hundreds of collectives around the world um, and this text directly addresses the state, for example. Uh, they say the rapist is you, it's uh, the cops, the judges, the state, the president, the oppressive state is a mature rapist. So um, as most of the literature we knew came from English, German or Portuguese speaking backgrounds, uh, we first noted that there was a need for translation. Unfortunately, we soon found out that uh, there were there were also very few credits for translation um, in France, at least two French, um, and this led us to abandon the original idea of an anthology and to move towards the hybrid form that has our book today. Um, uh, the, the form is uh, that one. So after a short introduction, we wrote the text about the. Uh, 70 pages, uh, which is uh, somewhere between a synthesis and the reading of uh, the debates based on our own experiences and questions and the discussions we had together. Next come five texts in different formats, two translations, two unpublished uh, texts and an interview. And uh, I want just uh, to add that the book benefited from the exchanges uh, that took place during a seminar in which many French, Austrian and Polish colleagues and of course, a lot of uh, students too participated uh, during the year 2018. So thanks from, uh, from me too for this great opportunity. Uh, our motivation to create, it, create this book stem from the observation uh, of this lacking debate on queer feminist involvement with the state that stand in stark contrast to an actual explosion of feminist practices in the past decades in, in France. 
So in our in our eyes, feminist politics has become too complex to break the question down to a simple choice between a for or against positioning. Real queer feminist politics often have to navigate among very complex relations to these diverse state apparatuses, institutions, or state occurrences, and that go way beyond the simple duality of left hand versus right hand descriptions, right? So the welfare state has shown to be uh, the product of sexist and heteronormative politics, and queer feminist politics need that uh, therefore to move beyond the simple for or against position of, to the welfare state institutions. With our book, we wanted to stimulate discussions in the French speaking world on feminist, queer feminist relations to the state that go beyond the topic of institutionalization in order to analyze the diversity, but also the contradictory or conflictual nature of feminist and queer politics today, and in order to develop critical perspectives on our own implications and doing uh, uh, and our own implications with, without, or against the state. Another example of these very complex issues uh, of feminist involvement uh, is the, the debate on carceral feminism. How can we avoid double standards for different fields of politics? So no one would be against the in incarceration of racists or fascists, but at the but the same standard cannot be had for rape perpetrators, for example. Also because state politics are known to persecute much more working class and, and people of color for sexual violence than they do in rich or white populations. So in short, we wanted to develop alternatives to telling the her story of feminism as a story of different rights that have been gained, right to vote, right to abortion, right to go to university and so on. We, we need to challenge the fiction that men and women are equal because the law says they are. It is important to remember that the rights we have supposedly won are in fact most of the time the removal of previous prohibitions installed by the state, right? And that, that this has been done in a framed way. While it would have been uh, possible to decriminalize, decriminalize just uh, abortion, for example, it has been legalized in, it in Italy and in France within very strict frameworks, both of the hospital institution criminalizing actually feminist actions of, of, of self-organized uh, abortions. So if we analytically divide feminist politics into those that are working with, without, or against the state, this does not necessarily mean that the different categories are necessarily enemies to each other. Yet the important differences regarding the personal crisis, dangers, or the, the experienced repressions, um, the different accesses also to resources need to be highlighted. This is why we still like differentiate them, right? Um, so we're going to guide you through our contribution to this book very quickly in order to, to make our points uh, that we would like to discuss with you. The first one being the one uh, around the debate being focused very much on institutionalization of feminism and the question of state feminism, and which we wanted to move beyond. Um, in this context, we've been rather, we chose to speak about sexual politics in, instead of gender or just feminism, because we wanted to include the very complex workings of gender and sexuality in state politics. Uh, and, um, and understand the state administration as a field of struggle for very different forms of gender and, and sexual politics, which involve trans politics, but also marriage legislation, reproductive rights, gender and uh, sexual identity, but also family legislation. And all of these issues uh, can be linked to issues of residency, visa, or healthcare. Many conflicts have occurred, be occurred between queer feminist politics in, in this field and on the matters of whether the state recogn recognition is something that it's worth fighting for uh, or whether it, there can be a strategical use of these institutions and who should profit from them. Uh, the context of this debate is also marked by far-right attacks on these very same rights, making the debate even more complicated to have because, um, uh, because it polarizes them more and more. Yet we believe that the debate, the, uh, to debate these complex issues is very important also in order to avoid having the far-right setting our agendas of what can be discussed and what cannot be discussed, right? Um, Queer feminist scholarship has come to show the heterosexist genealogy of institutions such as marriage, family, and the separation of private and public spaces. Yet our own experiences with these institutions show that sometimes the ways in which we relate to them are very complex and need a deeper understanding. So the second chapter of our book uh, deals with the question, where did the colonialist, capitalist, and patriarchal modern state come from? Um, with this book, we wanted to bring to light the historical dimension of the construction of patriarchal state 
and the relative youth, uh, youthness of this organization of power. The challenge is to show how it is possible to get rid of it, which is, of course, the big question, or at least to think outside of it. Um, it is uh, also interesting to note with Carol Bateman that women were excluded from the social contract by its uh, very first theorists. The modern state has been established between brothers against the father, the patriarch. Women were seen as incapable of entering into a contract, except mysteriously the marriage contract. This is the reason why in the French Revolution, for example, women did not gain access to the right to vote with the other citizens. It also seems important to us to account for the ways in which the genesis of the modern state um, is based on the intersection of gender, class, and racial relations of domination. The witch hunt is a striking example of this, since, as uh, Silvia Federici shows, it served in Europe to silence the popular revolts that emerged in the end of uh, feudalism and in the colonies to silence resistance to imperialism. The modern state that emerges uh, between the 15th and 18th centuries also emerges as the guarantor of private poverty and with it of the family and of gender relations securing inheritance. Nationalist ideology has been a care lever in defining the natural uh, place of women in the family, a heterosexual family, of course. Of course. <laughs> so in the, in the third section of our contribution to the book, uh, we, were, we address the, um, the question of understanding what is the state in a more structuralist way, how, how does it work, how, what, what are the parts of it. Um, I can only like wave through the parts of that section because there's so much to say about it, but I will just mention a lot of stuff in order for you to also be, uh, just ask questions about what you would like to hear more about. One question we um, address in this section is the question of institutionalization um, that we've already mentioned uh, earlier. Um, and that we, especially also as both of us working in, in, um, in, in public universities, uh, found something interesting to, to talk about, like how can we in these institutions also, uh, as feminists, uh, have uh, develop our own position towards the state, right? The second one is a question of rights. And we've been meditating quite, a, quite some time uh, uh, together uh, on the question uh, on the saying of uh, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, who wrote that you cannot not want rights. So we've been thinking about this a lot. <laughs> um, there's a lot to say about about this, and and we've already mentioned Italian feminism, where there have been groups in the 1970s who refused to fight for the right for abortion because they said that there is not only uh, rights to be gained from the state, uh, but that there's also a lot of actions that are not that. Life does not only consist of actions that are forbidden or allowed, but that there's also a lot of things we do that are neither nor. And that, well, uh, the, the third question is the one of the apparatuses. So we've been uh, thinking about how to understand uh, the structure of what the state is. And obviously, a lot of uh, literature refers to Althusser's apparatus theories. We've been also looking into Wendy Brown's Foucauldian approach to take into account these four different forms of power, uh, legal capitalist, prerogative, and bureaucratic, bureaucratic power. And, and of course, this is also where Davina Cooper's work has inspired us so much uh, in her use of the constructive identity theories for understanding these uncanny ways in which the state has um, all these different occurrences. Um, one important point for us was also to point out that there's not only these like, um, these like different sections or apparatuses of the state, but there, the, the state also organizes a for, form of scalar organization, like hierarchy, in, infuses also hierarchies um, in, in social organization. Um, and last but not least, uh, we've tried to contribute to the discussion of, this, of these like different fragments and structures of the state in uh, suggesting that while it is, it can be helpful in an Althusserian way, to think of family and religion as being parts of the state, we kind of think that analytically speaking, it can be interesting to actually also um, see them as uh, distinguished from the state in the sense uh, uh, that it makes visible historical political strategies of queer feminists or queers or feminists in order to like play one power against the other, right? 
So uh, historically, sometimes it has been stra uh, strategically interesting to use state power against religion, to use religion against state power, all the family like that, and various examples we can give for that. And we ended the book with a, a, a chapter on how to get organized. Um, with this, uh, this, this text, we wanted to open to ideas of a multiplicity of strategies of action to do without the state or against the state. Uh, we wanted to talk, for example, about how feminists uh, managed to make security and justice for themselves without the state. Uh, we wanted to talk about feminisms in the plural uh, to recognize the importance of the diversity of tactics and not to fetishize some of them, whether it is a question of obtaining legal reform or, or burning the car of a harassing boss. Now, should we ignore the fact that some of them are opposed, that they cannot be juxtaposed, that not all feminists speak from the same social position, and that not all feminists have the same material resources to carry out their utopias? We wanted to acknowledge those moments where we turn to the state because we have expectations of it, uh, because we think the state is the, this great common pot of resources or when we expect it to protect us from violence because it is the only one legally able to do so. We try to think once again in praxis of how our relations to the state deploy at different scales, as uh, Connie Cornelia just said, and to revalorize the local as a scale where participation in public life is possible. We talked about libertarian municipalism and took examples from Chiapas and Kobane. We also took some time to think of our position as state agent, of how it transforms the scope of our actions, especially in a pedagogical context. What is the weight of our judgments? What are the consequences of the grades we give? So we will now quickly describe uh, the, the, the text that follows this first um, 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 main uh, first text that we wrote together. So the first one is the translation of uh, Davine Cooper's uh, uh, chapter. So it would be too daunting to synthesize <laughs> Davine's text in her presence. So we try to simply explain how her work has helped us to think about the state uh, to overcome theoretical difficulties encountered during our work. Our work. I just ended by talking about the multiplicity of struggles and diversity of strategies about our different relationships to uh, relations to, to the state and the different forms of the state itself that make it not so easy to know whether we are outside or inside, not easy even to know if the state is something real or if we are fighting against uh, windmills. In her chapter, uh, Multiple Identities, uh, Sexuality in the State in Struggle, um, Davina Cooper uh, uses the concept of identity uh, five years after the release of Butler's Gender Trouble uh, as a key to read the state and help to dispel this impression of vagueness. The state has no fixed form or essence or core, she says, but it has multiple uh, identities. And given the context, one or more state identity identities will be at the fore, while the others remain in the background. Some identities, like the character of the state within international relations, give the impression that the state is a corporate entity easy to identify. Like, for example, the United States confront Russia over Ukraine. Um, at the national level, the identities of the states are more difficult to identify and may seem to have contradictor contradictory actions. Like, for example, when a squad social center is um, evacuated by the police while it received the state grants. This anti-essentialist anti and contingent reading of the state <laughs> is both a specific uh, theoretical proposal on the state and a way of holding together the multiple queer feminist approaches to the state. So it has been uh, particularly useful uh, to us, and for this reason, we decided to publish uh, this text first. The second text was an original text written by the philosopher Rada Ivekovic, uh, who we asked for a, a chapter on the patriarchal and nationalistic history because she's a specialist on, on gender and, uh, and nationalism. Uh, and we're quite surprised when we received the chapter on the political alliances between, uh, between women and migrants. 
Uh, but um, it is true that today the nation state cannot be seen, especially uh, European nation states cannot be, uh, and their gender and sexual politics cannot be understood without referring to the supranational structures that play a great role in how uh, how the state's uh, 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 sexual politics play out. So we were very happy about this text. I have to rush very quickly. Please don't hesitate to ask questions on uh, on all of all of these chapters. Um, next come uh, the, the text by the anthropologist uh, Perrin Lachnal. Um, the, the text uh, leads, us, leads us to look at the case of Egypt, where the nationalization of the women's cause in a state feminism is uh, old since the country's independence in the years of the 50s. Uh, through the study of the political treatment on the issue of sexual harassment during the revolutionary period, she exposes how feminist issues only achieve state recognition when they can be hijacked for partisan and authoritarian purposes, um, and thus emptying them of their emancipatory project. And I rushed too, so sorry <laughs> to be so quick. And so the last two texts are one, a translation of a quite old text from Austrian political scientist uh, Birgit Sauer on the welfare state. And uh, because like there's often this opposition opposition made of this like women friendly welfare state opposed to this like male repressive uh, police part of the state. And so she kind of shows for the Austrian case how uh, the Austrian welfare state actively organized women's vulnerability and is therefore to be to help to be held partly responsible for what she calls gender violence. Um, and the last text is an interview with, uh, because I, in, with our book, we also wanted to show the differences between states. When we speak about the modern nation state, it's actually, uh, it's actually important for us to point out that one state is not the, like the other. So it's a difference if a state is a colonial state or a decolonized state. It's different if a state is a socialist, post-socialist or capitalist state. And so uh, in order to, to, to shed light on, on some of this, we interviewed two um, East German women about their experience uh, as women and feminists uh, of transitioning from a socialist uh, to a capitalist state and how uh, feminist politics uh, and women's situation changed in that process. Maybe I, I should just uh, say, uh, and uh, I need to say that the chapter of Davine Cooper's uh, came from the book Power and Struggle, Feminism, Sexuality and the State, uh, published in uh, 1995. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mario and Cornelia. Um, and thank you for trying to keep up to time. Um, so next we have uh, Davina Cooper with uh, Project. Thank you. Um, thanks, Clara, very much for organizing this. And to Marion and Cornelia, for including me in the seminar and also for your kind words on my book. And it's really nice to see that it's it's proven useful. Um, that's great. And it, hearing about the rest of your book, um, which I, I mean, the limits of not being able to read French mean I'm dependent on sort of hearing what it, what's in it, but thank you. So in this talk, I want to explore a do-it-yourself proposal for law reform that would abolish legal sex and gender status. Um, we currently have a legal sex in Britain, this is, based on being registered female or male at birth, and this also counts as our legal gender. And in contrast with other social statuses and identities, which aren't legally fixed or formalised. So you can change your sexuality or your religion or your ethnic identification without the state's permission. And while the state tracks these statuses and identities in different ways, it's not an offence to identify your sexuality, religion, or ethnicity as you prefer. So is there a good reason for sex and gender to operate differently? And do they in fact operate differently? And so this is what I want to talk about. And it's based on a four year ESRC um, funded research project, The Future of Legal Gender, which ends this April. And I'll say more about the project and the question of um, decertifying sex and gender in a minute, but. I want to start by locating this project within the trajectory of work I've been doing on the state since the early 90s. And don't worry, because this is be very, very, very condensed. But um, my work on the state and sexual politics began with the question of, can state apparatuses in capitalist societies be temporarily taken over by radical forces and politics? And what happens when they are? And this is really what Marion and Cornelia were talking about. 
and they were questions for me in the late 80s that were inspired by Althusserian and Marxist and structuralist and post-structuralist state theory. And I explored this question um, through lesbian and gay initiatives in British local government in the 80s, which is something I was actively involved with as a Haringey councillor, and which eventually led to a backlash into Section 28 of the Local Government Act. And from there, I continue to be interested in the capacity for state bodies and actors to operate radically, excessively, or otherwise out of order in progressive ways, while at the same time thinking about left critiques of the states and what states can do. But I've also been interested in how we conceptualize what it is to be a state and what the state could come to mean. And my last book, Feeling Like a State, explores prompts for conceptualizing what the state could come to mean within a more progressive transformative politics that doesn't abandon public governance structures, but reimagines them. So rather than taking the concept of the state as a kind of fixed or given, if we recognize it, that it can shift and move and does and is understood in plurally different ways, then there's also the question, which is a more prefigurative question of what would we want the state to come to mean? And how do, we, how do we even think about that? And what prompts and stimulates our thinking about it? Reimagining concepts can feel quite fantastical and remote from the materiality of social life, especially something like reimagining the state. Um, yet more progressive state imaginaries have material instantiations and prompts, whether it's radical municipal government, micro communities, alternative currency networks, um, and in experiments and do-it-yourself forms of state governance, such as citizen inquiries, grassroots constitutional practices, um, sort of imaginary ideas of seceding, like the People's Republic of Brighton and Hove, um, and things where you're involved in do-it-yourself law reform, which is what I want to talk about. So I'm gonna talk about a do-it-yourself law reform project. I'm, I'm just in the process of finishing with colleagues, which seeks to reimagine how gender and sex categories are used in law and the legal status they carry. And specifically about dismantling this status, um, which I'll refer to as decertification. Our present day system of sex registration emerged in Britain in the early and mid 19th century, um, among other things to stabilize male inheritance, the management of populations and the use of new science to do so, um, to regulate rights, obligations and prohibitions, including sex-based ones, and to ensure that religious communities not captured by the, by the parish system were fully incorporated within the tracking and settling of births and deaths. So in general terms, certifying from birth that people are female or male doesn't have a progressive history. But the situation in Britain today is a little different. Few laws explicitly differentiate between women and men, although some do, um, but including in remedial ways. And at the same time, gender inequality continues, both between women and men and in relation to other gender identities, which are excluded, penalized and subject to state violence and other forms of violence. So one response certainly to the latter particularly to the institutional exclusion of minority gender identities, is the proposal that the legal categories of gender get expanded to formally incorporate and recognize other genders, non-binary, genderqueer, agender, for instance. So being a woman or a man would remain a legal status, but people could also select other legal identities. In, in our project, we, um, amongst other things, interviewed probably over 120 people, um, and some suggested that this was a pragmatic, viable first step, given the attachment that many people have to their gender. But others suggested it would continue to fetishize and rarefy gender, that it would treat gender categories as um, meaningful and settled differences that law should recognize and that inevitably it would produce its own exclusions and outsides. So an alternative approach then is to decertify sex and gender so that they're not legally stabilized aspects of personhood. But let me stress that this doesn't stop them from being used as governmental or legal categories for equality purposes, with all the limits on, on that and the problems with that. But simply 
um, that like legal categories of race and religion and sexuality, they don't attach to people as a legally assigned or settled status. So why might decertification be a good idea? Decertification targets the communicative, normative and performative aspects of certification. So what certification tells people about someone else's sex and gender, the disciplinary norms it supports and the effects it has. Political attention has tended to focus on the first two aspects, but the performative aspects, how, certifi how certification contributes to gender's production are important to consider. And I want to emphasize that, to think about gender as something that's socially produced. So more generally from a progressive standpoint, decertification would abolish a formal legal system which places people from birth into unequal sex and gender categories. It enables people to live as legal subjects outside of legal categories of women and men, including, for instance, as a gender. It removes the need for formal gender transitioning procedures, which can be costly and slow and often experienced as intrusive, pathologizing, disruptive and controlling. It removes or undermines the harmful regulatory treatment that's accorded to children and adults both when their bodies fit a binary sex framework and when their bodies don't. It might help to counter early gender socialization of children, perhaps especially by authorities like schools, because they can't rely on a child's legal or formally confirmed status as female or male. It may also diminish the normative assumption that gender divisions in terms of roles, dress, treatment by others are natural or desirable. It may help to build an understanding of gender as a social and institutional process, rather than something that belongs to subjects and is, is just a feature of who we are. And in the British context, it would put sex and gender on a par with other social relations of inequality, rather than affording um, sex and gender greater institutional status. But decertification also raises concerns and I don't have very much time. So I want to briefly mention four that were um, expressed by interviewees in the project, and we can then discuss them later. So one concern was that decertification wouldn't reduce inequalities of sex and gender, but simply obscure or mask them. And one person put it, I thought, very, um, you know, sort of evocatively. It's like taking a number plate off a car and saying you've changed the car. You haven't changed the car and the car is still a car that's not going to deal with pollution, is it? So that's one issue. The second raised um, was that decertification would lead to distortions, inconsistencies, and a lack of continuity in data collection, such as um, with the census. And one person said to us, the data being collected is meaningless because it's not being held up to the same benchmark. How do you measure something if the measurement keeps changing? A third concern raised was that decertification would put women at risk or feared risk of violence or undignified forms of bodily exposure from sharing spaces with people they identified as male bodied. Um, and fourth, that decertification would make it much harder to regulate and organize gender or sex specific activities, provision and spaces. Um, such as domestic violence shelters, sports and changing rooms, since people could claim um, any sex or gender and there'd be no basis for disputing their claims. Or it would lead to sort of an endless negotiation and plurality and complexity in how categories are used. And a similar problem concerns affirmative action measures such as women only parliamentary shortlists where again it was suggested that people would opportunistically claim membership and their claims couldn't be disputed. So it, in my remaining time, I want to just respond very briefly to this last point. Can positive action operate effectively for women or for other subordinated gender categories without knowing who's in the relevant class? And this is something I'd be very glad to hear other people's thoughts on. If we take women only parliamentary shortlists, for instance, is a precise notion of who counts as a woman required? Um, of course, governmental and parliamentary politics are gendered in myriad ways, and changing the demographics of who sits as, a, as an MP is only one very small aspect of this. But to the extent that having more women MPs um, makes a difference, is certainty required? And does this certainty require knowing who counts as a woman? 
Now, the challenge of, of category membership for positive action clearly exceeds issues to do with gender. Positive action on grounds of ethnicity, caste, indigeneity, among others, often confronts similar dilemmas. And in these different contexts, dissent, community membership, recognition, optics, and registration come into play to determine who belongs within the requisite category. Can any of these then usefully apply to gender if we move away from imposed registration? Well, of course, registration could be elective. Um, you could choose what gender or sex you're going to be registered as, as later on. Reliance could be had on others' perceptions of someone's category membership, for instance, as a woman. We could think about evidence of category membership being used, and optics often tacitly are. But approaches that rely on perception can reinstate stereotypical notions of what it is to be a specific gender. And approaches that rely on formal actions, for instance, a person's use of pronouns or address, you know, have they used Mr. for a sufficient period of time, can make gender category seem from a critical perspective somewhat meaningless. They just become these formalistic, rather empty categories. Gender categories get used in law um, in progressive ways to the extent that they are, because they're seen as tied to relations of domination and inequality. So this suggests a value in naming the categories, but rather than appropriate their repressive framing, so a simple flipping round of the ways in which the categories have already been used to reinforce inequality, and you just say, well, we'll take up these, simple, these same categories to, to, to remedy it. I, I do think self-identification is a better starting point for positive action, but is it sufficient? Should something more be required? Um, particularly where positive action entails accessing oversubscribed opportunities or resources. And I'm gonna leave that question hanging and we can return to it later on. Of, and, but I'm thinking of it as a kind of positive action plus, not that you don't have, sorry, um, self-identification plus. So not that you don't use self-identification, but what else might be needed? So just to briefly conclude, what I've been talking about um, today is a do-it-yourself academic law reform project. While our focus has been on legislative reform, it's not because we see state law as the key lever for creating change, either in practice or, or ideally. We also don't assume that decertification's introduction would necessarily take a progressive form. It could be part of a neoliberal project that privatizes gender and gender-based subordination and inequality. The state simply steps back and says, this has nothing to do with us which picks up the point Marianne and Cornelia were making at the end. But beyond prototyping what legislative reform could look like, um, do-it-yourself law reform as an academic method has two other key advantages or, or perhaps uses. One is to explore the changes already underway. So we might think of this as making other legal and normative orders visible as different public bodies, service providers, and employers increasingly treat gender as a status that's plural and informal. And that really emerged from our research with councils, trade unions, regulatory bodies, and others. And secondly, do-it-yourself law reform um, stimulates questions about what gender should come to mean and how it should come to be enacted in institutionalized and non-institutionalized ways. In this sense, our project is a prefigurative one bringing an imaginary future law into present day discussion to, in a sense, rehearse and explore its implications, to encourage discussion about change that stretches beyond what's already on the law reform table, to provide a way of reflecting critically on the present and the present regulatory structure, and to see what prefiguring a law reform proposal in the present climate might do and accomplish, but also very much what it can't do. Thanks. Thank you very much for such an interesting talk, um, Davina. So uh, next we have uh, Dr. Marquis Bay, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, for all of you being here and sharing space. I'll be a virtual uh, with all of us. So I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna talk for maybe 15 or so minutes, uh, but I also have learned to preface my remarks too with my disciplinary leanings. 
Uh, so I'm deeply, very much a theorist and a philosopher, uh, and I'm, I've been trained by and uh, influenced by other theorists and philosophers who also might be considered as poets. So I want to just name that that seeps into my writing as well. Huh? So I, I guess this is a, a way to uh, organize or anticipate um, your expectations uh, and encounter with what I'll share with you all. Okay, so I'm going to be talking in a very general sense about abolition and gender radicality. So my talk today derives from my forthcoming book, Black Trans Feminism, as well as a bit from another forthcoming manuscript entitled System Failure, and that system spelled C-I-S-T-E-M. From the introduction, in fact, of these texts, I shuttled back and forth between what I should speak about, and I hesitated to share this portion. It is not the most head nodding portion of the book, nor the most concrete, nor the most readily assimilatory into the current intellectual habitus of the left. But it is, to me, the portion that suggests what I think and feel most forcefully as a politics with respect to gender. And I hope I might be read as offering a measured and compassionate articulation of something I've been stewing over for a while and that I simply cannot get away from. What I seek to share with you all in this brief time is a meditation on radicality and gender abolition. So from the outset, I ask that you please forgive me. Abolition as articulated here is broader than just prison abolition, both in that it is concerned with systems of oppression and captivity that are things other than prisons, and in that the prison is to be understood much more capaciously than just the institutions that incarcerate people behind bars. Abolition can be succinctly defined, at least for my purposes, as a modality and orientation to life and livability that is not reactive against quote unquote bad prisons, but a way to make forms of carcerality impossible. Abolition is not one spectacularized event, but a quotidian working toward eradicating carceral logics as predicates for sociality and relationality. Like what Sarah Lambeau terms everyday abolition, I offer abolition as changing the ways we interact with others on an ongoing basis and changing harmful patterns in our daily lives, questioning punitive impulses and relations of captivity. My project urges abolition in a broad sense, the making impossible and creation of a sociality indexed to the impossibility of carcerality, any form of captivity, which can include categorical taxonomies, a gentle circumscription and the like. We create abolition and do abolition in each moment we move toward the alleviation of subtle ways of curtailing the ability of others to become liberated. It is fundamental to an ethics of nonviolence, which is to say the commitment to refusing the proliferation of the originary violence of ontology, among other things. Abolition in doing away with the very violence that has orchestrated our very sense of ourselves and the world, an orchestration that has dictated who we have been permitted to be and who we permit others to be, is a quotidian effort of mitigating violation. I understand and proffer abolition as putting pressure on even terms such as revolution. A prominent understanding, though not the only understanding, but a prominent understanding of revolution is akin to a seizure of the means of production. It manifests in taking or taking back the government or capturing the office of the CEO. Underlying this, however, in, me, in my opinion, is the assumption of an inevitable and natural government in office. Uncritiqued and simply taken for granted is the shape of power itself, which is implied to inevitably look like the state, by which I mean not simply government, but a horizon of stanched possibility and set of practices predicated on circumscription order, law, and discipline. The state, that is, as a relation inflected through punitivity, transaction, investment, and hegemony. And furthermore, there is the assumption that the state and its limbs are recuperable rather than definitionally progenitors of violence. On one reading, among other readings, revolution seeks to equally distribute the violence embedded in the state. I'm interested, on the other hand, in doing away with the state. And since the state is a relation rather than a mere establishment, the state relationality takes myriad forms, racial taxonomization and gender binaristic imposition and hierarchical sex classification among them. More than just resistance, abolition as made here to engender my project of black trans feminism is committed to moving beyond the state in the service of collective liberation, making a, found, a founding coalitional drive constitutive of it as well 
It is a call for something other than epistemic mastery over where we should go from here. It is a provocation to care more than we can know, to extend our analyses past the ruins of the world and the discipline as we know it. We do not need to know for certain the parameters of what comes after this hellish landscape, and perhaps we cannot know if we are truly to get to a place not beholden to extant modes and conceptualizations, what is primary is that we care for and about one another's livelihoods. We then cultivate the conditions that can lovingly accommodate such livelihoods. Black trans feminism is also committed to gender self-determination in a way that slightly departs from the term's popular conception. Typically, gender self-determination is believed to simply be the acceptance of everyone's right to choose whatever gender they want. I say my gender is X, which means you must respect that and if you do not, you are impinging on my right to determine my own gender. This is sensible and not entirely off the mark. The gender self-determination argued for here disallows the building of hierarchies for genders. It disallows battles between genders based on proximity to a mythical realness or authenticity. Gender self-determination is much more than any person, any gender. For such a conception of gender self-determination, the one that seems to be in place now, bears traces of neoliberal individuation, presuming that the process of gender is extricated from sociality and also nevertheless evaluate the contours of that gender through a marketplace economy of its use value, legibility, and ability to still be productive. The gender self-determination affixed to black trans feminism is a social dance, but a sociality not really here. Black trans feminist gender self-determination avows a subjective cultivation of ways to do illegible genders, genders that abolish the bestowal of gender, genders that allow us all to be and become expansively outside of the very desire to have to be so onto ourselves and others a gender. This means that when we advocate for gender self-determination from this purview, we do not say yes to any and all genders one chooses, it means we advocate for the ethical requisite to say no, or better, to decline to state with regard to the imposition of gender. How then does a wide reaching abolition, which includes the abolition of the ontologics of racialization and gender, hold with it self gender self determination? It is maintained that gender self determination, as argued by queer injustice, quote, requires that we reach toward abolition, not just of prisons and for some of us, the police but of the system that produced them, which replicates systems of policing and punishment beyond prison walls, unquote. The systems spoken of are not discrete entities that we can do away with while leaving the general landscape intact. They are the ontological order that has bestowed a fundamental sense of being onto anything that can be said to properly exist. In order to self-determine one's own gender, it must be the case that one, there is an unviolated self, which is to say the abolition of self towards something like another kind of self. And two, what is determined by that self must be non-coercive and non-compulsory, which may again be to say abolition of gender as we know it. Gender self-determination is both a theoretical and philosophical practice, as well as a discursively enfleshed practice that utilizes a coalitional desire to create a space in which gender might be fashioned radically non-compulsorily and non-violently, or without imposition and immutability onto oneself and others. Thus, gender self-determination is a movement toward dissolving given gender ontologies. In short, the commingling of abolition and gender self-determination is actually reciprocally facilitated by each, since one cannot emerge through what I would deem genders that might have arisen but for gender, if the latter has not been abolished, if abolition must be a project not only of closing violent doors, but the cultivation and proliferation of nourishing and transformational things, abolition cannot occur without gender self-determination as gender is one of the chief forms through which coercive compulsory violence and captivity are carried out. And gender self-determination cannot be actualized without widespread abolition. <clears throat> Indeed, sex rooted in the gender binary hands over gender assignation to someone outside of oneself, someone buttressed by the medical and juridical institution to bestow the validity of gender. One's inaugurative possibility is quite literally deprived from them and instantiated in another. This is far from self-determination. This is another's literal determination of oneself and one's self. 
Gender abolition is about coalition then for me. In truth, I do not want gender. And truthfully, even more, I do not want you to want it either. Because the wanting to want it is, I think, wanting to want a kind of carcerality and extrication from the sociality that engenders possibly radically other ways to be with one another. Though I do understand the desire, I do. And I desire that to that not wanting to, to happen now. And it is deeply unsatisfactory to wait to do that while purportedly more important things are hashed out, especially not in service of some kind of ethics. Like we can't get rid of gender right now or else how will we adjust address gender-based harm. Gender, for me, on one reading, is the harm. What is sexism, discrimination, and assault along gendered lines but the committing of gender? We need not settle or even, or even the, we need not settle the parameters of even gender or woman in order to advance a politics in service of those harmed by sexism and indeed harmed by gender itself. When laws and social policies represent women, Judith Butler writes, reflecting on the legacy of their now 30-year-old book, quote, they make tacit decisions about who counts as a woman and very often make presuppositions about what a woman is. We have seen this in the domain of reproductive rights. So the question I was asking then, back in 1990, is do we have to have a settled idea of woman or of any gender in order to advance feminist goals, unquote? And I would say the answer is no. We can and have and should be doing subjectivity and sociality in ways that engender a different terrain on which we can live that need not and perhaps should not be concerned with a particular demographic. Not because that demographic does not matter, but because it's less about the demographic and more, much more about the mechanisms in place, the histories, variable as they are, the discourses, the systems, the institutions, the structures, the networks that create demographic delimitations to be placed in hierarchical and antagonistic relationships. It is about what happened that made logical the invention of a denigrated class of people or non-people as natural. That is the cause we must not forget. We have all this discourse on policing as deleterious to the well-being of our communities and as radical abolitionists, we demand the end of policing. If we are to live this assertion, to really be about that life, it is crucial to heed an ameliorative and abolitionist politics toward the ways that gender is policed, which is not to merely say the ways certain genders are derogated over others or against others that are permitted sovereign sway, but more, the ways gender itself function as an extension and iteration of policing. Knowing this, we have work to do. Namely, we are, and this is a quote from uh, Alan Badu's uh, Can Politics Be Thought? <clears throat> Namely, we are, quote, to avoid at all costs the danger of helping the existing cops and judges by becoming a snitch, unquote. Or when we see illegible genders flourishing or different or various departures from the gender binary, we are not to snitch on those genders. Indeed, we are to engage the philosophical radicality of gender abolition by, quote, again by Badu, lending an ear to the signal rather than rushing to the police station, unquote. The chance for no cops and no prisons includes the gender police and gender imprisonment too. And since gender is an imposition, a non-consensual required imposition, we are punished for not receiving on the terms of the imposition, which puts gender in the realm of a transitive verb, then gender abolition would just as readily urge an anti-gender disposition as it would urge, like many already do, an anti-racist and anti-capitalist disposition. What intrigues me in this articulation <clears throat> is a deviant echo of a mellifluous chiming of Jasbir Poir on Brian Masumi's work. How might we degrade the cartographical maps that have, been, that have been imposed not simply on, but as our bodies? How do we salvifically refuse positioning ourselves retroactively into a gridlocked self, which is to say definitionally identity for something that we are forbidden from becoming? unrecognizable, unbounded, unself, all of which are to say in different ways, an abolition of the strictures of having to be something, how we can, as Eliza Steinbach says of trans studies, remain in an indeterminate, non-fixed space and suspend the desire for retroactive installment of ourselves and others into the paradigmatic, racialized and gendered grid. It may not be about erecting something at all, 
it may be much more fruitful and interesting to think of how we can come to something like what we might have been through gender abolition, through, as it were, a project not of putting things together, but of viewing with soft eyes, feeling with humbled breath, the gloriousness of how things fall apart. In the shards lying there is a mosaic of pieces you can pick up <clears throat> and carry with you, fondling it in your hands, tucking it in your pocket, only to discard it later. Or you can stomp on the shards, grinding them into smaller pieces, awing at their disintegration. Or further still, you can step over the pile, walking into the sunset. Thank you. Wow, well, I am speechless. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for this wonderful intervention and for all of uh, your contributions here. Um, so we now have um, some time for a Q&A, &A, but before we get into the Q&A, um, I wanted to stop the recording. Um, so Elian, can you help me out with this?